Hi, my name is Hugh Fike. I'm the current director of government relations at the Conservative Partnership Institute, and I worked in the Office of Management and Budget and the Executive Office of the President doing legislative affairs uh, on the House side. And I'm joined by my friend and former colleague, James Braid. Hi, I'm James. I've, I've worked in various uh, senior roles on Capitol Hill. Uh, I worked with Hugh in the administration in legislative affairs at the Office of Management and Budget, specifically handling appropriations. Currently, I serve as the Legislative Director for Senator J.D. Vance. And we're here to talk about congressional relations with the administration. Essentially, it's going to be a Legislative Affairs 101. In the eyes of many in the world, this every four-year ceremony we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. In America, we understand that a nation is only living as long as it is striving. Only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. Whether we go forward together with courage or turn back to policies that weakened our economy, diminished our leadership in the world, America's future will be in your hands. Let's kind of get into it. I'll just sort of uh, surface kind of the top top line understanding of how I think about the Hill from a theoretical perspective. The Hill is a mechanism for information processing. So we have all these preferences, all these different issues, all these different um, policies that are happening in the United States. And uh, how do we make them into a coherent legal document that actually can can maybe do some uh, good for the people of the United States. Well, we have this huge machinery uh, called Capitol Hill, which is, you know, includes the procedure, right? You might think of that as the software by which the computer runs. You might think of uh, members of Congress as the individual decision-making nodes. What we do in the executive branch in legislative affairs is serve as the surface area between the decision-makers in the executive branch and the decision-makers in Congress in hopes of pushing information and persuasive policies out there so that we can influence the operation of that machine. And that's what we're going to talk about today, some of the basic strategies that we need to pursue in order to ensure that the president's agenda uh, is considered as favorably as humanly possible on Capitol Hill. Yeah, I think about it if you get into a legislative affairs job that you basically have three marching orders. One, you got to have staff relationships. Two, you got to have good principal relationships. And three, you ultimately need to know what the issues that the members care about. So speaking specifically to staff relationships, if you're on the beachhead team, uh, you know, I didn't serve on the beachhead team, but everybody that did say you're, if you're changing r administrations, if you're basically switching from a, you know, from a conservative to a liberal administration, you're not going to be left with the tools or you're not going to have the lists of things that you're going to need, absolutely need. So one of your first priorities uh, is to obviously work with, uh, you know, the administration to figure out what the priorities of the uh, agency or the part of the administration you're in. Um, but then start developing lists of members um, that include staff members for the equities or the things that are, uh, are necessarily going to be important to your day-to-day -day job. And so what you want to do is immediately start creating lists of the committees on Capitol Hill, both on the House and the Senate, that, uh, that are going to be important for um, direct legislative jurisdiction over, uh, over your agency's areas. Um, then you need to start doing individual meetings with them, putting a face to a name. That's really important. Um, and then you need to have, uh, make sure you have the right contact information. These are in sometimes very quick uh, moving um, decisions and they are quick moving and that you need to be able to directly communicate with those people, not just via email, but be able to pick up the phone and call people because things move very quickly. And in the administration, I found that you don't always have the uh, most amount of time to be able to prep or give uh, members or their staff heads up, mm. um, but you need to do that right after the thing is announced. Um, so 
that staff relationships. Talk to me a little bit about what it means to have um, good principal member uh, relationships in that you, you are directly engaging with the uh, members that are either on the committee or important to your principal. One of the things I would say that is a little bit uh, of, a, of, a, of a surprise, I think, to people who encounter Congress for the first time is that each individual Hill office is a small business unto itself. They have different cultures, they have different relationships between staff, and they have different decision-making structures. And those structures are entirely idiosyncratic. You can probably take a guess that the chief of staff is going to be an important decision-maker, but often you know, a legislative assistant might be the key decision-making person in the area that you're looking to work on, right? And so I think to your point about we come in and we don't have the infrastructure built and we're not going to get the infrastructure and we have to build the infrastructure on the fly, I think the absolute core aspect of that, that infrastructure is segmentation. You've got to come in and understand relationships that are important and vital to form immediately. And those, those categories of people are going to be the authorizing committee for your agency, the appropriating subcommittee for your agency, and then the full committee on appropriations, as well as any other authorizing committees, because often jurisdiction is spread uh, throughout uh, different committees. But you've got to really have those relationships locked down. Now, in many cases, when you're a legislative affairs person, you might actually have a direct relationship with the principal, but your principal, your cabinet secretary, your undersecretary is also a really big gun. And those are the kind of people that members want to get to know, members want to have. Um, that relationship. And I, I think you hit on such a great point about these relationships. First of all, like I think we overestimate and we think of uh, lobbying as this kind of super complicated thing where you have to be chummy and, and have drinks with people and, and, and like be best friends with congressional staff in order to achieve stuff. Actually, in order to get most of the benefit out of a relationship, you just need to know that person. You just need to have that introductory meeting. You need to have an introductory meeting without an ask. So it's just like, hey, I'm James, I'm Hugh, I, you know, this is what we do if I'm ever messing your stuff up, and then get that cell phone number. I think what the point you made is so important. A lot of times we're dealing with a huge aperture of policy. We don't have time to monitor every piece of political development throughout that, that, that legislative process. So sometimes you end up jammed, and that's when your cell phone number and your introductory meeting pay dividends because you can have that frictionless conversation with the decision maker that you need. And so that's really, really key, is just segment and then get yourself in the door face to face with these guys. Make sure they have your cell and you have, you have their cell. Absolutely critical. And, and, you know, really, that's a lot of it. Once you're there, that's when you can think about strategy. That's when you can think about all these different things. But that basic introduction is really the foundation of um, uh, how we approach things. Then I would also maintain your record keeping, right? Uh, I think it's really important to come in with a robust understanding of what, we, what we're trying to do, what you have done for a particular decision maker and what you want to do, um, as well as different interactions, different asks that they have. Like that, that record keeping is really going to stand you in good stead because what it serves as is the basis of strategy, right? You know, we, we do the basics, we get, we get in the door, we talk to these people, whatever. Then we build a strategy, right? And so you, you want to talk a little bit about how you think about, so we talked a little bit about staff relationships, maybe how you think about once we have kind of the basic relational sort of architecture of our particular position, it could be the Commerce Department, the EPA, how do we proceed then in the generation of kind of a legislative strategy based on those relationships? Yeah, no matter what agency or, or sub-agency or what part of the administration is, if you have an adversarial Congress, you can almost assure that your boss at some point is going to get brought before the committee. So you want to be able to delineate what members uh, your boss need to meet with um, ahead of those committee hearings or ahead of those questions um, so that you're able to, one, make sure that favorable questions are asked, and two, potentially... Um, uh, you know, head off any questions that might be, uh, you know, hard for your boss to answer or for the administration to navigate. Um, and I think having that uh, member to member or principal to principal relationship 
is going to be really important to make sure that they know that it's not just the administration's uh, you know, goals to, to help advance what's going on on the Hill, but it's also the members in members' direct interest that there are a lot of things in their district or in their state that are really important in that agency. And so being able to help them advance their priorities um, is something that they want. And they want to have a closeness with the, with the administration in a way that um, shows that they're doing work, that they're able to accomplish things, but ultimately that they're able to tackle some of the things that might be important for their, for their district or state. Well, since you brought it up, let's talk, let's talk hearing preparation just a little bit briefly. I think that's a core aspect of, of some of, like, you know, some agencies have a pretty heavy hearing tempo, others don't. Um, what are some of the key elements? You know, you've, you've done this with a number of different administration officials, murder boards, the rhythm of a hearing. How do you think about maybe setting that up? Yeah, so you'll want to make sure that um, you have a bead on um, who the uh, who your opponents in Congress might be. So those are going to be people probably, um, you know, who don't share the administration's values, or your boss's values, um, and, and get a sense for what they've asked in the past of these types of hearings, because you know, a lot of these hearings happen, um, you know, administration, administration, year to year. So you get a pretty good sense of what they might ask. So you do a little opposition research. Um, and but then you want to set up, um, you know, a murder board. So basically, um, make sure that your uh, principal is as prepared for the hearing or prepared for an interview as possible. So you're creating basically a list um, of charges and responses based off of those uh, off your opposition research. So then you want to work with uh, your allies on the committee or allies um, in the Congress on saying these are the things that we are likely to be asked. These might be good follow up questions to ask. Um, but also, if I get jammed on a question, you know, give me some time, rehabilitate the witness, give me some time to respond that isn't directly going to suck up um, a question from you. Um, and then ultimately, it looks like maybe doing meetings beforehand. Mm -hmm. So bringing people into the room, saying, here's where we're at, and getting actual answers to their questions about what they may have so they're able to better understand the subject matter. And I think that's a really important point, the rhythm of the hearing, right? I mean, I haven't testified in front of Congress. I don't, I don't know if you have. I don't, I don't think you have. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, there's a, a fundamental difference between getting beat down for five minutes and then uh, getting a break for five minutes versus getting hit continuously with hostile questioning. And so, you know, getting to that rhythm and, and, and getting members there, right? Like a lot of, you know, we, we were talking about the subcommittee level or, or, or otherwise, you know, members aren't, you know, your, your members might not want to come Sorry. to a hearing that's deliberately crafted by the uh, opponents of the, of the presidential administration. Uh, like they, you know, they don't they don't particularly focus on on the issue set that 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 this is this is set up to beat you down with. It's not something that's very favorable to the administration. But if the if the members of Congress who defend you aren't going to be in the room, you're going to have a long long morning. So. Yeah, that's a, that's an extremely important point because of the way that uh, you alternate between one side and the other and asking questions. If there aren't uh, a stream or there aren't members um, there to defend you, then you're going to be just inundated with hostile questions. And so being able to get that break and answer questions about the subject matter from friendly uh, members is really important. Um, you know, so kind of progressing to the third point, knowing the members um, that are aligned with your administration's issues, how do you go about knowing those? How would you go about researching them? Obviously, there's a, a congressional track record if they're in Congress. Sure. There's not a track record if they've not been in Congress. So how do you be able to identify those issues so that, you know, if your agency or your sub-agency or whatever part of the administration is, does something in that member's kind of interest area that you're able to, you know, to push it to them and have them echo and support and, and come out and endorse what you've done? So this is this notion of issue uptake, which is such an important issue. Like, how, like and it really is one of the trickier aspects of legislative affairs, which is we are trying to find uh, what in a former uh, life you and I would call a champion, right? We're trying to, 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 to find a champion who is not merely going to support an administration policy when he has a decision point directly in front of him, but to actually advocate in advance that administration priority. That's tough. But what you need, going back to the segmentation, is a pretty good psychographic profile of how members tell themselves stories about their careers. Um, and, you know, 
I think probably, you know, obviously there's some of the, the clear ones, congress.gov. If the member has decided to introduce a bill on it, that's the most costly thing a member can do from a time, staff, and political perspective in terms of position taking. Well, that means they're probably pretty interested in the subject matter. And if you have an administration initiative that's orthogonal, right, maybe it's about government waste, maybe it's about deregulation, maybe it's about, uh, you know, restoring American energy. They happen to be, you know, a big proponent of that. And maybe it's about nuclear energy. They're a big proponent of nuclear energy. That's going to be, a, you're going to be pushing on an open door. So doing that psychographic profile, I would also strongly advise anybody to look, get the Almanac of American Politics, the latest version, spend the 85 bucks. Uh, it is incredible. It will give you an understanding of the geography, both political and social and human, of every member of Congress, every governor and every senator. It is incredible. And from that, you can start to build out uh, what your targets are and what you what you think might be best. Um, the other thing is, you know, you gotta, uh, at that point, right, so uptake is, is a heavier ass than vote, so that's when you get your principal in there. That's when you do a little star star power, right? You get, the, you get the secretary, you get the administrator, you get the director over there and say, hey, we'd really like to do this, which will show the, the uh, member or the senator that the administration is committed to this policy, and therefore, if they do perceive this policy, they can expect to receive actual backing as opposed to merely a thank you from a staff, which I would love it to be a, a gracious sufficiency is often insufficient for uh, members of Congress. So, Yeah, and one, one area that I found major success in was, especially if they had a long track record, was just going back through old press releases. <laughs> You know, uh, a digital, so digital communications has not always been a real thing. And so the standard of uh, press releases and sort of old school uh, communications um, has only, you know, it's only in the last handful of years really changed. So if they've been in Congress for a lengthy period of time, going back, you're going to find most amount of information in old press releases. This is absolutely maybe the best tip. Like if you walk out of here with nothing, understand that you may understand what a member cares about, but what he issues press releases on at a very rapid clip. Everything else is built on top of that. And like those press releases will tell you immediately what they care about. They will tell you how they think about an issue, right? Um, and uh, uh, just totally invaluable. In terms of, in terms, there is no better member evaluation tool out there than the media tab of a member's congress.gov website uh, uh, in terms of time investment versus output. And so go through that, know those. Yeah. I think that's absolutely like really critical kind of congressional lore. Yeah. And they, they will tell you what they're trying to do. Yeah, <laughs> they will tell what the, they care about. And those are communicated because they want people in their district or they want people in the media to know. <clears throat> Um, and uh, in similar fashion, they, most members will issue like a weekly or a monthly newsletter, and those are going to communicate even more deliberately about mm -hmm. um, what it is in either the district or what it is in either the Congress that they're doing. Um, and a lot of that stuff can pop up over August recess. And can sure. you talk a little bit about why that might be important? So members are receiving and being barraged by a constant stream of information, right? And so they unlike normal sort of people who, are, who don't have to do this, members are constantly forced to make permanent, irrevocable decisions about what they think about politics or, or policies, right? So like, you and I will not have not voted, right? But you vote as a member and you are like sort of permanently liable for that vote throughout the entire recorded span of the American Republic. So they're constantly kind of on the lookout for real information about what a particular decision actually means. And so during recess, um, in a lot of cases, they'll be home, and when people bring stuff up to them directly, they pay attention. And so, you know, if you can, if you can find a way to get information uh, emitted to, to members when they're in their districts, in addition to from, like, key local decision makers or whatever, that's really going to change uh, on a, a member's political calculus in a way that a merely DC lobbying can't. They listen to their districts, they listen to the to their local papers, they, they listen to those things, and they, they find that information very real and very persuasive. And even if it's not persuasive, it changes the political calculus. And so uh, thinking about how you can, you know, maybe influence a member in the, in the district or show that an issue affects the district is really, really important. I think that's a good segue to something that is a, a key advantage. You've got a lot of deficiencies in uh, the administration. It's a difficult job, very difficult job. And so lobbying is a hard job and doing it well is even harder. But one of the core advantages you have is your ability to produce information, right? 
So August is a particularly critical time to apply and deploy that information. But, you know, you have the, a horde of careers available to you that work, work uh, essentially for you, depending on the division. You know, real information about how government programs are actually working is often quite difficult to acquire. Like who, how much, how it's working. You can get all that stuff. You can get it correctly. And you can get it out to sort of influence the information space. So understanding how your career staff and your, your, poli your other policy divisions are like producing information and understanding how you can frame the terms of that debate, like how much money is being spent, how much money has been spent on a particular thing. That's very difficult to acquire for an outside observer, but you can choose and pick uh, that information uh, uh, because you have access to that, to that information fashioning power, which is so powerful. I think in, in particular, knowing, um, and, and as we kind of wrap up here, knowing um, what you talked about, knowing what your uh, uh, powers are, right? Knowing how and what levers you have and when to pull them, mm -hmm. um, that's not always communicated from one administration to the next. So um, if you do get a job, you should try to find the person most aligned with you who had the job prior to you. Mm -hmm. Go meet with them, go talk to them, ask them, hey, should I, uh, should I go meet with anybody else? Like, get to know the people and ask them what it is that they didn't know when they showed up that, yeah. that you would like to know. Um, and so um, just in conclusion, um, you know, I think, you know, staff relationships obviously matter, principal relationships really matter, and knowing the issues uh, that uh, of the members with direct equities on the, on the committees or um, that are directly interested in your agency or sub-agency's, uh, you know, um, bucket of, of issues are is really important. I don't know if you had any closing yeah, thoughts. Yeah, so I'll just, I'll just make two, two, two uh, points as expeditiously as I can. Number one, part of the, the, the difficulty and core of, of being an effective legislative st affairs staffer is understanding what you have actually have to accomplish on a particular administration policy initiative. You know, if you can do it solely through executive action, that means you need to protect the executive action. You don't have to go out there and, and um, uh, pass a law, right? And so what you do need to do is prevent an executive action that could be politically unpopular in the Congress by preventing the junction of Republicans and Democrats, right? Well, that, that's, that's when, the, I mean, the Congress is the Article I branch. The executive branch in modern times is more powerful, but Congress unified will beat you. Mm -hmm. And so you need to prevent the effectuation of that junction. That's really important. So thinking through that is, is, is key. You know, if you, wanna, if you need to pass a bill, you need to get, I don't know, $500 million for something. Well, that's gonna have to get passed through the Congress and Congress requires bipartisan action for the most part if you're, if you're trying to beat a filibuster at 60. Um, and so calibrating your investment, calibrating the, the expectations of your team um, is really important. And then finally, I would just say, you know, it, there's an old adage in Washington, uh, friends come and go, but enemies are forever. Very heady stuff leading the administration's position on Capitol Hill. Don't be a jerk. Always maintain your relationships. It's always better to, to, to not burn somebody. And so that's the thought I would, I would definitely leave with. Don't be too aggressive. Be firm. Be tough in the service of the president's agenda, but, but do not be a jerk. Yeah, that's a great point to end on, James. Thank you for uh, this discussion, and hopefully it's uh, fruitful to those uh, watching. Absolutely. Thanks, Hugh.